So I was approached by this German author, his name is Rolf Ackermann, and he had quite a substantial idea for a novel which he wanted to turn into a short film. So out of his storyline I chose three elements that were really interesting to me. The one was the flute melody, then the whole setting in the pre-independent area, and lastly the, the idea or the notion of reconciliation. The most challenging aspect of Dead River was its budget. It was quite an ambitious script, which was not only meant to serve a Namibian audience, but also an international audience. We managed in the end to produce the film on it, but also with a lot of in-kind sponsorship. Farm Garib is a farm that I've known for most of my life. The real family was very open to my request when I went out to see them and explained that I would like to do this sort of a film on their farm. Das war ein einmaliges Erlebnis. So viele Leute und so viel Kreativität und Chaos und vor allen Dingen für uns sehr fremdes Thema Film hier auf der Farm zu haben. Wir haben viel gelernt, sicher von Filme machen und was alles dahinter steckt und die Hochachtung vom Film hat sich sehr angehoben. Dead River is a period film, so casting uh, posed a particular challenge to us. We needed to find characters in their childhood, uh, grew up in their teenage years and eventually became adults. The most fun about acting in Dead River was I was acting with all of the actors who also had no experience. So no one could laugh at you that you were doing something wrong or anything because it was also the first time. It was very nice, amazing for me. First time, so everything was new. I had to get used to all the terms and what do they want from me, where do I have to go and things like that. I think for me the best part was um, the, being a first time. To get on the big screen itself and to be the one the camera is following and whatnot was actually an um, awesome experience. Except for David and Javira, they were all first-time actors. You need to first sort of get them comfortable with portraying somebody they are not. And with children that went pretty quickly because for them it's like playing a game. For adults it's a different story. For adults it's, it's they have to sort of loosen themselves from their own individual being and then find a new sort of way of being somebody else. For the character itself, the challenging part was to find the synergy between the three actors. Me, David is the eldest, and then the younger David and the youngest David. You've never met, but uh, for a very short period of time you have to kind of find that linkage between you as people and that you can actually become one person. Somehow, visually, there had to be a difference between the end and uh, the beginning of the 80s. So it was very clear that I would ask him to grow a beard. It took me about two and a half months to, to get to that beard. Every day when I woke up and I looked in the mirror, I realized, okay, I have to learn to become that role. I grew into the character as my, my hair grew out of my face. So in order for us to, to get the, the different times right and to make a stark um, differentiation between it. The older scenes were shot first. And then we reset after that to his younger version. I cut the beard off totally except for the moustache and we then colored my hair totally dark black. In terms of the production I think it was a clever way to work it simply because we had to go from a deteriorated sort of a place, not only in terms of the character, but also in terms of the location and the story. We had to go from a deteriorated place to a place that's still more or less intact. Easier to make it look fresh, because it looked fresh when you were at it. It was basically going into the bush and getting loads of dead bushes and grass and plant them everywhere. Basically make the place look run down and not maintained. The first day of actual production um, had been quite a significant day in my life because it had been over 12 months since I last actually directed something. So I was very eager to just get the ball rolling, to hear my own voice say action, uh, to see the camera roll and then 
this beautiful camera decided that no, I'm gonna give you blurry shots all morning long. And Frederick really tried hard to figure out what the problem was. We have a few days before some tests done, and it's actually all very good functioned. And on the first day, we had to leider that the film adapter was damaged by the transport. And we couldn't work with it. Nicht arbeiten konnten. Das hat aber dann auch eine Zeit lang gedauert, bis wir halt sozusagen die Fehlerquelle gefunden haben und hat uns sogar einen halben Drehtag gekostet. Also das war nichts, es war kein, kein schöner Start. The toughest one was the one where I had to speak with Lisa on the porch. I needed to be very uh, consistent in how I was doing because they would shoot scenes from different angles and whatnot. And you would want the same type of expression. So I needed to actually keep on focus and that, that was the longest scene I've ever done. The story is about a friendship between the daughter of a farmer and the son of a farm worker that meet through a melody. I had sort of heard that Alessandro Alessandroni, the world's most renowned whistler, has made Namibia his home of choice for most of the year. Alessandro Alessandroni is known as the whistler from films like The Good, The Bad and The Ugly for a few dollars more, a fistful of dollars. And I had a meeting, I took him through the script, explained the storyline to him, explained the, the idea of the music, the whistling and the flute playing. And about one and a half hours later we were drinking red wine and eating pasta and celebrating our future cooperation on this film project. When I was reading the storyboard and I have read the bow to whistle, this, I was uh, really happy because the whistle is my, in French, is mon métier, my profession. So I was really lucky and happy for that. Being a young director to work with somebody as legendary as Alessandro Alessandroni, that was a mind boggling experience. That, that melody, hoping that the, 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 the director liked it. To have somebody like him on the set just, I think, gave us all a motivational booster of magnificent sorts. Really happy to be involved because uh, the atmosphere that you can breathe in Africa, in Namibia, especially in Namibia that I love, is uh, quite, quite uh, unusual. Yeah. So I got a lot of emotion. It was very nice meeting Alexandro. I was actually really nervous because I knew this was his song. I kind of wanted to do it like perfect for him because <laughs> he was there. He makes such beautiful music in the night when he played for us, it was so amazing. And when I, I met him, he's, he's so kind and everything, and he gladly helped me with pl when I was playing the flute and when I couldn't get the last note right. Um, he, it, was so, it was so nice because I kind of thought that, I don't know, he wouldn't talk very much or anything, and then he was playing for us and everything, so I thought it was really cool. The whole crew, we were together and eating and he got out his guitar and he played guitar for us. I think that was a very, very special moment. I've tried once before in my life to make a flute. I don't remember if somebody showed me anything exactly. I think the most important part of the flute is where the, where the air stream hits this angular piece which breaks the, the air and creates the, the sound. So I was trying, before I met Alessandro, I was trying out and it did make sounds, not the nicest sounds though. And uh, 
when uh, when I gave it to him the first time, he said, "No, yeah, it's okay, but uh, you know, you need to tweak here a bit and change this a bit." I don't know if it made such a difference in the end. It would have been nice if it would have played a little bit better than it did. I think. <laughs> Yes. Tim gave me the script and as I was reading the script, I was hoping there would be a scene where I can at least say something. But then I read, all I do is just, you know, I just look like, it's like I'm lost. But it was still cool acting. In the early 1980s, there's a scene where young Lisa arrives um, at her mother's grave. And in the script it was written that there's a herd of cows in the background, that's why young David is there, he's herding the cows. And it proved to be slightly more tricky, getting those cows to be in that specific position. We had, I think, three or four guys which were designated to keep the cows in place and eventually they did manage to do that. We didn't have a lot of time to film, but on the other hand, we couldn't deal with close-ups either way because those cows are tagged with present-day tags that you can't just remove. That basically they didn't have in the 1980s, so we just needed to keep them in the background at a certain distance, which the four guys that were the cow wranglers managed formidably. It's called Running with the Cows, the movie that you're making. Can we keep them more or less in that area? The director is an old cow runner. A cow runner of note, reputation that precedes him miles and miles. So he will know exactly how many cows we need. It's good to be under the leadership of an excellent cow runner. The dinner scene takes place in the early 1980s. Timmy wanted a juicy steak. When you cut through it, the blood runs out of it. Adolf had to chew on meat because that is what was scripted and that is what had to happen. And so the sound recorders on location also wanted to have nice chewing sound. You can actually hear it. If you listen closely to the, to the soundtrack of the movie, you can actually hear it. That piece of meat which was supposed to have been tender and, and really great, was horrible. After take three or take four, you try and cut your slices even thinner and thinner, but you can't because you know, it has to be the same size as the previous, the previous take. When he was chewing, it sounded like he was chewing on hard rubber. And the only thing I could do not to laugh was like lightly kicking myself in the leg because it was just so funny. Cat eyes freak me out. So then, once when Tim would invite me over to his house to get to know me better and to get to know the other people, I told him that he took pictures of his cat's eyes and then placed it all over Adolf for me to get scared. I think my heart stopped for a split second because I was freaking out. Because Tim came to me and said, whatever you do, stay David. I wanted to run away, so, so I was freaking out. And pause. look on Shaquille's face when he saw the cat eyes from Jens was so amazing. I was, I was just laughing because we all knew what was happening except for him. <laughs> you look terrified. What's going on? Don't ever do that again. On your birthday. <laughs> do one more. It is calm. It is calm now. Our biggest worry shooting during the month of January in Namibia was the rain. How are we going to get around it? Uh, we had such a restricted budget that we couldn't afford in any way to go beyond the eight shooting days that we scheduled for the shoot. The most significant, and this is now when it did become interesting, when we started using the rain to our advantage, 
And this happened actually when we shot quite a central scene of the film, which is where young Lisa departs from the farm after her father has beaten up her best friend. Das sind aber solche Erlebnisse, die irgendwie auch das Team zusammenschweißen. Ich habe das ganz lustig gefunden. Auch wie du herumgestanden bist im Regen. Weil du warst der Einzige, glaube ich, der nie irgendwas über den Kopf gehabt hat. The fun thing about that is that the camera crew and myself, we were actually standing in that rain and I was completely drenched within a minute. Das war ein bisschen eine Herausforderung, weil wir jetzt nicht so gewappnet waren bezüglich des Regens. Und das Wasser war schon so stark, dass es sogar schon von unten gekommen ist. Das heißt, ich habe phasenweise nicht gesehen, was ich gefilmt habe. Okay, was one of the most magical scenes and I think it's also one of the most unforgettable one of this film in particular. This is rain on the bonnet of a 1985 Land Cruiser. Toyota Land Cruiser. We had um, two scenes which required the camera to be mounted on the car. The one was where late 1980s Adolf and Lisa returned to the farm and we tried various versions of getting the camera onto the car there. We tried with the steady cam on the bonnet, that didn't work. The easiest version was to use handheld camera. So as the cameraman sort of trying to bounce off as much of the juddering which is happening from the gravel road and got me the best possible shot. The more significant one was um, when Lisa, as a grown woman, now returns to Namibia and she's been picked up by her lawyer, Evelyn Matthews. And we had an entire dialogue taking place in the car while the car is driving. Now for that we got a trailer, we pulled the car onto the trailer and we noticed that the trailer might be of a nice size, however it is not made for filming, so everything was jiggling and wiggling and quite a nightmare per se. But somehow we managed to in the end have the camera installed on the bonnet and with a poly board over the camera so as to take out the reflection of the sky and put an image stabilizer over it in post-production so as to get the best possible look. The steady cam was one of those important tools that the director envisioned would assist him to bring Dead River to life. The Steadicam definitely allows you to follow the, the character to places where conventional camera moves won't allow you to follow. That's why I was pushing to get Steadicam for this film. However, having said that, this was the first time that I actually worked with Steadicam, so I didn't have any experience how to implement it successfully. So much so that one scene which was also originally planned for the Steadicam is completely out of the film nowadays. Old Lisa arriving at the airport and phoning her family back at home and we have the whole Steadicam walking back with her. For someone to have that courage actually to, to visit a place of pain, the camera had to sort of emulate that grandness of that moment. And to me that translated into a crane shot where you sort of start right next to the character and you lift up into the sky as she goes closer to the point where she will finally resolve issues. I felt a very good moment was where we filmed the death of Adolf. Just to see Jens go as far as he did and convincingly die in front of the gravestone, coughing up the blood and stuff, and Christine breaking down. There was a lot of strong emotion at that scene and I particularly like that when you feel the emotion within an actor. I had to cry and cry and cry and cry a lot and that was 
physically and emotionally very draining and you are really feeling empty afterwards. I like the last part between me and Adolf, the whole shooting scene. It was kind of very frightening to actually possess a gun in your hand and showing it to someone. The shooting scene was probably the most difficult scene for me to accomplish. There were a lot of factors involved. The first one is that you have to point a hunting rifle at a person. And the second thing is you have to switch from two modes. One of them was that deep despair. This is at the grave, just prior to me picking up the rifle and, and pointing it at David. Um, there was this deep despair where I actually revealed and showed my inner vulnerability, not expecting anybody to witness it. And within a second, a split second, I had to change from real despair and sadness and vulnerability into that rage and fit of anger. The third aspect to that is that you have to really swear in the most derogative manner at a person with all the crew standing around there. So again, you are exposing yourself in a way, playing that bad character. Um, we even shook hands and um, we both were actually emotional and there were tears in both of our eyes after the whole shooting of the scene. So it was quite an amazing experience. And whenever we get to meet, we he's always like, that was a very good scene that we did together. So it was a very good experience. Our makeup artist Beverly was so ingenious as to source the IV bags, you know, from the IV drips and fill in some blood there so that she would be able to release blood with a siren coming out of a wound so that it looks like the bullet has just hit here and the blood is sort of streaming out. With that river on a very subliminal level, but on a very significant level, video effects came into being. For one, young David, being Shaquille, being a 12-year-old boy in 2012, has braces. However, young David, the character early 1980s, there would be no way in hell that that boy would be wearing braces. So where the video effects artist Christoph came in is he had to remove the braces from frames. The sound recorders happened to hang the boom a little bit too low in the shot. So again, the VFX artist came in and he removed that boom. I think his most significant contribution, the one that really mattered a lot to me, is creating the nozzle of the gunshot being fired. We are really in a fortunate time that we can rely on VFX artists to include some little elements into our film that help tell the story. I had a phenomenal art director on this production. We had to fake that we are actually inside a flat in Europe. That was due to budget constraints because we couldn't fly over all the actors and everything for one little scene. First of all, finding a building that somehow makes you think or feel this is Europe or Germany specifically um, is not that easy. There's two details which I'm a bit sorry about that I couldn't quite fix with the interior flat. That's the light switches and that's the door handle. That's schön. Okay. In order to sell that element of the story, we needed to incorporate exterior shots that are from Europe. Fortunately, the director of photography, Frederick, he is from Austria and he got us a couple of options of exterior shots. Clearly that wasn't enough. You also need to add something on the sound level because what you hear in Europe is different than what you hear here in Namibia. And together with the sound designer David, we, we chose to incorporate very typical sirens into the sound design. The sound designer David chose that a lot of the film would have to be re-recorded in post. Well, in the African bush has a lot of 
sounds, especially summer rainy time. There's a lot of uh, a lot of insects, a lot of cicadas. It's a very intimate film, and we just found that even with clean recording on location, the background noises just didn't suit the mood that we wanted to create. So we decided to just remove all all audio and to bring the background noise and the, and the bush sound in at the level where it was complementary to the intimacy of the, the film that we were trying to create. Don't be. We can't undo the past. We can only change the future. Don't be. We can't undo the past. We can only change the future. Most of the dialogue had to be re recorded. I would say about at least half of the movie was re-recorded. All the post was done at Tom's apartment. We mixed at Tom's apartment, set up a little makeshift studio. And all the folio was done in the living room, in the middle of town. Working with Alessandro, Alessandroni, um, was an amazing experience. International caliber musician, professional, Humble. Um, for me, it's always great to work with such people. David, wait! It's <laughs> <laughs> perfect. It was just amazing to see how he approaches a film how he goes about it, that he still writes his notes, you know, on paper with pencil and that you see the entire song laid out in front of your eyes visually and then you hear him playing from it and immaculately. production was definitely challenging and it took a lot out of me but it also gave me a lot of gratification in the end. It's a film that I can be proud of and that I will never be ashamed of having made because it carries a very important message for the country at large, not just for me or you or you but for all of us. <laughs>